If you look at the lackluster inflation that plagued Japan, the struggles with trying to invigorate economic growth, and the concern that we're going to see a Japanification of the rest of the world, where monetary policy isn't going to make a dent in the bigger picture. I mean, how, how do you get out of that? You get out of it by pivoting away from excessive, long reliance on central bank to a more comprehensive pro-growth policy approach. Um, it's not the engineering use This is about politics. And I think it's important that we get this pivot quickly because, as you say, increasingly, you're either pushing on a string when it comes to unconventional monetary policy delivering good economic outcome, or in the case of Europe, you have become counterproductive. You are causing more harm than good at this stage. So the bad news is that we really are at a position where central banks are in a lose, lose, lose. They can't do more, they can't do less, and where they are is uncomfortable. The good news is there is a policy package that can get us out of this, but it requires political implementation. Well, that comes down to the fiscal side of the equation, Mohammed. I presume that, that's what you're leaning into. What could be the biggest shock if we think that we've hit, and I'm right, if I'm right, you're saying a reversal rate in European rates. Um, what could be the shock of 2020? A shift in rates or a shift in language for the ECB? So first, it's more than, than fiscal. Um, it's fiscal for a few countries like Germany and the Netherlands, where there's fiscal space. But it is about structural reforms. It's about getting the European architecture complete. It's not enough to have just a monetary union and half the banking union. There's a list of things, um, a menu approach, if you like, that goes beyond fiscal. In terms of, of, of the shock, I don't think the ECB will step back in any major way. But the major risk comes if the markets lose confidence. The markets continue to believe that while the ECB will not be effective in promoting economic outcomes, it will be effective in boosting asset prices and in repressing volatility. So there's still market confidence in the asset price impact of the ECB. The big shock would be if markets lose confidence on that. Well, I mean, at the moment, the early signs are that we're not going to get a revolution from the ECB. We're not going to get a revolution at the Fed, even though both policy pictures are in a bigger review. In terms of what to expect from the Fed specifically, the Markets Life team asks that exact question as we get into 2020. Uh, should markets be pricing in a Fed move for 2020? What are your thoughts? So I think right now the Fed has been clear that its most likely outcome is on hold. I believe, Yusuf, that it's only a matter of time until the market starts trying to impose on the Fed again a rate cut. Um, I think that the market will start getting worried that the confidence that the global economy is bottoming out when it comes to its slowing is not is misplaced. And the Fed and the market will look to the Fed to deliver another insurance cut. So I think what we're going to see in the next six months is the Fed trying to signal that it's staying on hold and the market renewing pressure on the Fed to cut. I do not think that the Fed will raise rates in 2020. OK, well, let's take that forward into the twos, tens curves, because in your morning note this morning, Mohammed, you say, interestingly, it was the curve that shifted very, very little. I was looking at twos, tens, and we have, and I put this to you, have we traveled and arrived in terms of steepness in the twos, tens, Mohammed, for now? Because you're concerned about global risks, perhaps, rather than U.S. risks uh, in terms of looking at the curve. Give me your perspective on, on, on whether we write, on, on where we go from here. So if it was just a U.S. issue, um, I would say we stay where we are, around 22 basis points for the two stands, and maybe actually widen a bit more. But it's not just a U.S. issue. Um, every morning I look at another differential, which is the U.S. versus Germany, at around 212 basis points today in 10-year space. Mm -hmm. um, let's not forget that what happens in the U.S. is heavily influenced by what happens in Europe. And if we see renewed pressure on the two stands to narrow, it will be because European rates are imposing downward pressure.
Mohammed, the folks at, uh, at City raised their target for the S&P 500 by, uh, by quite a bit. Now they're looking at 3,375 for the end of next year. Uh, where do you see U.S. stocks headed amid the uh, wider conditions that we just discussed? Look, for a while I've been saying, Yusuf, short term, you can be constructive. And you can be constructive because a ton of liquidity is being injected by central banks. Um, Bloomberg has a great story on this today in terms of quite how much liquidity is being injected. Um, the Fed may not mm. want us to call it QE, but for markets, the effect is like QE. And then you have the, the Bank of Japan and the ECB, as you know, that has renewed its QE program. So between the liquidity, between the technicals, I can see why people are short-term constructive. My worry is at a certain point, you've got to reconcile that with all the uncertainties we've talked about. And that's where it gets tricky. Well, now, whether that happens in the next few months, after the middle of the year, of next year, or at the end, I don't know. But I think the right approach for investors is to keep a claim on the upside while increasingly protecting against the downside, which means an up in quality trade across the, the board. And fortunately for investors, they get opportunities to do that. Okay, so let's keep a stake in the, uh, in the upside. The most read story, Mohammed, I need your opinion on this briefly. The most read story is that from the BIS, the repo blow up was fueled by big banks, it was mayhem. And there are structural problems. This wasn't just a temporary hiccup in the market. And if you look at it, four banks, Mohammed, four banks in the United States hold 50% of the treasuries and 25% of the reserves. Your take on the liquidity crunch in the repo market. So I think the BIS is pointing to something very important. Remember, not only did the spike in the repo rate come as a surprise even to the New York Fed, they haven't been able to normalize it as quickly as they thought they could. It hasn't proven to be temporary. It hasn't proven to be fully re reversible without massive injections of liquidity, which means that structural issues are playing a role. And I think Manus remember this phrase that comes from the CIO of Gramercy, illiquidity in the midst of liquidity. We are going to see pockets of illiquidity play out because we have structural imbalances in various parts of the financial system that have been for now hidden by ample liquidity, but at a certain point they impose themselves. You're going to see it in segments of high yield, in segments of emerging market, in segments of loans, and you've even seen it in the wholesale funding market. So just remember the notion of pockets of illiquidity in the midst of ample liquidity.